Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. It's Alyssa. I am here with my notable reads from July. Every month I have been wrapping up my reading by focusing on six books that I found notable for the month. I have really enjoyed doing this sort of shortened wrap up for you guys because it makes it a lot easier for me to focus on the books that I really truly enjoyed during the month. But I had a request to at least go through all the books I read in a month. So I'm just going to use my Bookly app, the infographic they give me at the end of every month to tell me all the books that I have finished. For some reason this month isn't 100% matching up with what I have on Storygraph, but I don't know what's going on there. I have to look into it. I don't know if I finished a couple things like at like midnight or something and they crossed over or I don't know. But I have four times one, two, three, four, five, six books. So what's that? 24 books here on my bookly thing. I'll put the graphic up here so you can see all of them. And I've covered up the guys that are going to be on my notable reads just so you don't know what those are yet. So let's go through the books that I've read. I read Last Night at the Night, Last Call at the Nightingale, which is a like jazz age kind of mystery. It's a little queer. It was fine. I don't have a lot to say about it. Controlling Women, What We Can Do Now to Save Our Reproductive Freedom. Very informative. Wish it was something that everybody was sort of required to read before Roe v. Wade was overturned because there's a lot of stuff that's happening now that is stuff that was happening in the historical things for like why we had Roe v. Wade, the things that were occurring that made it so that we put Roe v. Wade in place are occurring like ra were occurring rapidly after the overturning. So I mean, it is it is worth a read if you want more education on just like our reproductive rights, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. I read Vox, which is like a feminist thriller where women lose the ability to really speak. They can only speak like 100 words in a day. Otherwise, they get shocked, not like a little shocked, like crazy shocked. Uh, the Book of Night by Holly Black, which despite the fact that so many other people thought it was boring, I really enjoyed it. I wasn't expecting anything from it, so I think that could be some of it. It was just enjoyable. Did it change my life? No. Do I remember everything about it? Also, no, I'm not obsessed with it. But I thoroughly enjoyed the experience of reading it while I was reading it. I finally started the Daughter of Smoke and Bone series, which I'm going to continue on in September because August is just like, I'm trying not to get into a fantasy groove in August because once I do that, I'll stop reading women in translation books. So we're focusing in August on a lot more like literary fiction. So, but I enjoyed it so far. I still don't think that it's better than Strange the Dreamer. And I know some people that go one way and some people that go the other way. I'm still holding firm that Strange the Dreamer is the best of Lainey Taylor's writing. I read Lincoln in the Bardo, which was weird. Uh, a Lesson in Vengeance, finally, which was fun. It was the kind of more YA dark academia that I had been looking for. I had a good time with it. I enjoyed it. I read Unsettled Ground for this book prize I'm judging. I've been judging over the course of the year, I different rounds of judging. It was fine. It gave me some cold comfort farm vibes. The dogs are doing something downstairs. I mean, it was all right. They really don't want us talking a lot about the books, but like, I didn't hate it. I didn't love it. Uh, the Women's House of Detention was our July, T no, June TBR lowdown pick, and it took us a little while to finish it because it's a really tough read, and I think Bambi and I are attempting to set up an, like an interview and discussion with the author about the book because it's there's a lot to break it down in it break it down break down in it and we're not really sure how we want to do that on our own it's like kind of hard I read The Promise by Damien Galgut Galgo Gagate The Promise and it it was really good enjoyed it again for this book prize and I understand all the hype behind it. I understand why it won. I believe it won the International Booker. I could be wrong on that one. I think it was the International Booker last year. And it makes me want to learn more about South Africa because I feel like we don't, I think as like uh, Americans, we don't learn a lot about anything other than maybe like Europe, circa like World War II and like post-World War II and the Cold War and like some vague American history to, but not really. I read The House on Mango Street, which was phenomenal. Gave me lots of Clarice Lispector vibes. Loved it. Need to do a reread. Need a physical copy. Need to mark it up. So good. Uh, what Moves the Dead by T. King Fisher was just fun. 
I enjoyed this. It was a good little horror novella. Perfect vibes. Loved it. The Island of Missing Trees, again, is for this book prize that I've been judging. And I absolutely loved this book. I thought this book was phenomenal. I had no interest in it until it was on like the judging round. And I'm glad that I got to read it because I probably wouldn't have read it otherwise. And it was really a great book. Legends and Lattes, which you guys already know all about because I did a little mini review of it, a rambling review. Hopefully you guys have picked it up. It is so just cozy. It is cozy fantasy and I need more cozy fantasy in my life. I read Night of the Living Res, which was our July pick for TBR Lowdown. This is another pick that we have not done a live for because we want to talk to the author. This was a very interesting collection of connected short stories about a young boy living uh, on a reservation and like his life on the reservation. And it's very, a slice of life makes it sound like, like cozy but it's it's like a look into a slice of living on a reservation and what that really kind of looks like and it was definitely interesting but we we really want to talk to the author about it because it's it, it's a very interesting read it, it's worth reading I, I would check it out the hollow gods which was like a cw show in a book it was fine i need to read the second one at some point goes something or other. In the Shadow of Spindrift House by Mira Grant, which was Shauna McGuire. And I figured out which one I always think is Shauna McGuire, but it's not Shauna McGuire because I always confuse her with Mira Grant. And that is Mindy McGinnis. For some reason, I always confuse this with Mira Grant and I don't know why. So I think that Mira Grant and Mindy McGinnis are the same person. So therefore, if so facto, if A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. And so therefore, they're all Shauna McGuire. No. That is not the case. And I also finally finished the Mindfuck series, which you guys can see. I don't know when that vlog is going up, but it's already filmed and done. It just needs to be edited. So it's either out now or it will be out soon. So if you want to see another I Read This So You Don't Have To vlog, Mindfuck is coming soon. So that leaves us with six books that I absolutely loved this month that I haven't told you about yet. So we're going to talk about them. And we're going to start right at the top with my girl, my fave, Emily St. John and Dell, Sea of Tranquility. This book, I read this in like a weekend impromptu. Alyssa's having a 24 hour readathon with herself. And this book was phenomenal. This is a multi timeline literary sci fi that explores the idea of worlds on like the brink of pandemic, on the brink of extinction, on the brink of like major change. The uh, sort of twists at the end, the thing that draws all these timelines together is a little cliched, but I don't care because the book is so phenomenal. Her writing is amazing. The book is super, super quick to read. Her writing is just like you zoom through it because you want to know what's going to happen next. It ties into The Glass Hotel. So if you love The Glass Hotel, you can like have a little taste of some of the characters from The Glass Hotel that maybe you missed. And it's just a wonderful, wonderful exploration of the importance of living your life to its fullest because you don't know when that day is when everything is going to turn. So like it kind of is a pandemic book, but a pandemic book in the sense of that like you're just on the cusp of something and you don't even know it yet and how like every civilization is on the cusp of that. And there are multiple moments before a civilization falls or there's multiple civilizations that have fallen and there's moments right before the fall. And what is it like to live in those moments before the fall? And it's, it's phenomenal. I love, I love it so much. I mean, she can really do no wrong in my humble opinion. And I can't wait to read the three books from her that I haven't read yet because I need to. Next up is The Immortalist by Chloe Benjamin. This book was so good. I think I talk about it on a TBR Lowdown episode that's either out now or coming out soon. And this is really what makes you question if you knew the day that you were going to die. Whether that was a true statement or not, how would you change the way you live your life? Uh, four siblings go to this, like, for lack of a better term, this Romanoff lady, this gypsy, terrible term, don't use gypsy, but I think that's what they call her in here. They go to her for fortune telling and the fortune that she tells, they hear that she can tell, predict and tell your day of death. 
and they go to her when they're pretty young. They are uh, four Jewish children. There's two boys and two girls. Their parents are sort of like sort of typical New York Jewish family, like kind of conservative Jewish family. They go, they go, they find out their things. They don't really say anything to each other. And then each part after that, you see how each sibling lives their lives. And it is just really, really interesting. Because obviously, like, one lives longer than the other. And then, you know, they don't all die on the same day. They're all dying on different times at different points in their life. Some are young, some are old. How does it affect each other knowing that you all have this secret that you know when you're going to pass. How does it affect how does it affect each other, like the choices that you make? Because like each sibling makes their own choices based on this information that they have. And then those choices they make, how does it affect the other siblings? It is a really, really interesting, interesting book. I was not into it until somewhere through the first sibling's story and something clicked. He goes off to San Francisco. He doesn't want to be like take over the tailor shop that his father has. He doesn't want to be his father. He wants to be himself. And he's the first story. And it took me a second, like the backstory that gets you into that first story, that first like sibling story. I, 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 I was not into it. But then I was really into it. Yes, I highly recommend this. Of course, A Strange and Stubborn Endurance is on this list. I did another rambling review of this wonderful, wonderful book. So I'm not going to say a lot about it here. If you want to hear my full thoughts and my thoughts on content warnings and trigger warnings, you can somewhere I'll link the review of when I talked about A Strange and Stubborn Endurance by Foz Meadows. But this book is so good. If you like sort of renaissance medieval fantasy, but you also want more like of a modern mentality put in there. And if you want really phenomenal, just like discussions of gender and sexual politics, if you want a sort of wonderfully supportive relationship, especially when one side has gone through like a really terrible trauma, this book is so good. It is detailed. It is beautiful. It is so good. K is like the best husband. We all deserve a K. Next up, for all my Sagro Lit lovers, Writers and Lovers by Lily King. This is my first Lily King. I really loved this. I thought this was phenomenal. We are watching Casey basically figure out in the summer of 97 what the hell she's doing with her life, right? Her mother has died suddenly. She's in these two love affairs. One's with sort of like an objectively like put together older, like better man on paper. The other one is like kind of younger and more her age, more her peer. He's kind of flighty uh, or appears to be kind of flighty. He seems to be like the, the less good option of the two. She's uh, trying to write, but she's also trying she's also working as a waitress and you just watch her go through her life as she figures out in that sort of quarter life crisis uh, that we kind of all go through uh, how to what she wants to do with her life who she is what does she need where is she going what relationship should she be in should she be in any relationship and uh, do you go with the objectively good relationship or do you go with the one that feels more like you feel more connected with what do you want like it was just such a good time. If you like Sally Rooney, if you like A Test of Moshvig, if you've never read Lily King, pick it up and try it. It's really good. I feel like I'm not telling anybody to do anything new here because she's a really well-loved and, and well-read author. So do I need to tell you to read Lily King? No. Am I going to? Yes. I'm going to also add on this list The Confessions of Franny Langton by Sarah Collins. I finished this as an audiobook and then basically like three days later went out and bought a hard copy of the book so that I can reread it with Naomi and annotate this because this is phenomenal. And I guess they're making it into a TV show or a miniseries, something like that. And it is so good. You have Franny LinkedIn, who is a slave um, in Jamaica and her father and slave owner takes her to, after something happens in Jamaica, she takes, he takes her to England with him and leaves him, her in this house with the, gosh, I always forget their names the Benhams, and she basically becomes like a lady's maid to Mrs. Benham, and they start to make a, they start to have a romance that brews uh, between the lady of the house and Franny. But the story opens with Franny, she's 
she's arrested and on trial for the murder of the Benhams. And as the Myrtle, Myrtle, as the murder trial unfolds, you also get all of Franny's confessions. And those are from Jamaica to present day. She goes through and tells you basically the story of her life. And you learn about the things that happened in Jamaica that made her who she is. You learn about the things that she saw as uh, sort of this like apprentice to her, to Mr. Langton. Do you just see her and this relationship with the, the wife, Mrs. Badham, develop? You see her struggling with fitting in in England with the other servants in the house. You, you hear her thoughts on like gender and race politics at the time. It is a phenomenal, phenomenal, phenomenal book. And I, mm, we all need, read it, read it, just read it. It's so freaking good. And you want, you want the ending to not be what you know the ending's going to be for Franny. And the whole time you're reading this, you're like, please. Because you just, you, you grow to love Franny so much. You're like, I understand all of your motive. I understand you. And you just know, you know, you just know, you know, the ending is unavoidable, but it's so good. It is so, read the book. And then finally, I have The Passenger by Ulrich Alexander Boschwitz. And this book is phenomenal. This is 100% a Eric Carl Anderson talked about it on his channel and the cover is phenomenal by. And what's in between the cover doesn't disappoint at all. This, this book, this book, like kind of like Sea of Tranquility, which you're, you're on the cusp of like a major shift in civilization. This is about a major shift in civilization. And you're following our main character whose name I cannot remember is Otto Silverman. And Otto Silverman is like a, a well-known businessman in the area. He's Jewish, but happens to be able to pass as Aryan. He's married to a white Aryan woman, uh, non-Jewish woman. He had a lot of status, but now we are just after during the Kristallnacht and the Jews are starting to be rounded up in Germany and he's in Berlin. And things are getting very difficult for, like, this is like the jumping off point of everything with the Holocaust and everything else. Like, the, the concentration camps are starting. There's the rumors about what these concentration camps are. Basically, at this point, Otto cannot leave Germany. It is incredibly difficult to get out of Germany. His son is in Paris, and his son has been trying to get him out. And... He just, he's just can't get everything together. Like the time has passed, but Otto has missed all the other opportunities to leave because Otto did never thought that things were going to go the way they did. And they do start, as everything starts to unravel and unfold in Nazi Germany, Otto is stuck. And as he's stuck, he just keeps riding the train to different places. And you're just watching this man ride this train around Germany in his desperate, desperate attempt to try to get out of Germany. And he's going here, there, and everywhere else to find people to help him, to do this, that. Like people send him here because they're like, this guy's gonna get you out of Germany. He goes here because this guy is a, an acquaintance of his that should be able to help him. He goes here because he needs to get this. He goes there because he needs to get this. But essentially, you follow this man riding through all these trains, on all these trains, and, and he's just descending into madness as, as he rides around and around and around and around and he just cannot escape the fate that is now awaiting him because he didn't get out in time. And it is beautifully written. It is so sad. And it is just, it is such a must, must read. And I wish more people would talk about this book so that more people will read it because it is just, I have this note in here. I just opened the page. I have so many notes in this book. The paranoia of just existing must be exhausting. This cat and mouse game, this, I don't know if I'm going to be caught. If anybody, the amount of times he's on the train and some other Jewish person gets called out by somebody else and now they're getting carted off to somewhere and the fear that Otto has and the more times this happens, the more that fear just corrodes his psyche. And 
it's so insular and just you want him to get out so bad it's just this book is so good and you you must 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 read this book this is 100 one of my favorite books of the year you need to read the passenger so these are my six notable reads for July. I hope that you guys will check some of these out and I hope you've enjoyed the little like summary of all the books that I read other than my six notables and I don't know if these are like my top favorites because I don't really rank my books like that uh, but these are definitely six that I want you guys to know about because they are just so stinking good. Uh, if you enjoyed this video, uh, please consider liking and subscribing. Otherwise, I'll see you guys in my next video, whatever it may be, because it's my channel and I can do whatever I want. Bye. So just sit with me, talking to the night until the morning, building cat mystery. I don't think I ever want to go come closer next to me, trying to find another way to say this, but I think, I think.